Hello. Um, right, can you just pretty much all tell me if the sound quality is fine, if the volume is fine, if the camera quality and positioning is fine? Should just do a... Was forget to turn my own volume off so I can actually not hear myself. Okay, good. Um, right. Well, firstly, out of the people here who it, um, who wanted the um, stuff on sequencing and uh, genetic engineering, did you watch my videos today? And if so, were they of any help? I'm mainly asking because I've already had uh, three requests for sections on, actually no, four, four different questions just on the two videos I've done today. So while I'm more than happy to go through them, if you haven't watched them, it might be an idea to watch them just so I can go through other stuff as well. I'm more than happy to if you still feel that you need to go through it after the video. I don't know how useful the videos were. Well, uh, Glitter Girlie, I can answer your question. But was it your yeah your question? Um, it's easy to introduce a gene into a germline cell compared to a somatic purely because in a germline it is a sex cell is undifferentiated and unspecialized. Um, it's a stem cell eventually, uh, effectively. So that means that um, because of that, uh, when the when it does become when it does differentiate and specialize and become you know a proper cell. It will already have the corrected gene in it, and it means you can transfer it to the next generation. If it's um, in a somatic cell, which is a body cell, then it's already got all of its genetic material. When it replicates, it's not going to pass on that gene you've introduced because it's not part of the actual genetic code. Yeah, that's essentially the reason because in it is easier because the cell is uh, a stem cell, so stem cells are much more, you know, just they will take things in a lot easier, keep them and replicate them for the future. I don't know why some people's comments are getting randomly spammed. I hmm.
little hit. I feel weird sitting here just not talking because I'm waiting for the responses to come through. Is there a lot of lag on this or something, or a, lot, a larger delay than there was before? Uh. Okay, chemistry question. Um, the whole concept of equilibrium leading to A2. Um, yeah. By that, do you mean you just don't understand what equilibrium is at all, or you don't understand the A2 ideas that are put forward? And again, I just asked, out of those two people, um, yeah, out of the two people who asked me to do some stuff on the genetic sequencing and electrophoresis, human insulin. Um, can, ha, please just say if you've um, seen the videos or not, because if you haven't, can you go see them first? And we can go through them. Uh, uh, can I explain the difference between temporal and spatial summation? Uh, yep. Yeah. All right. Um, where is it? All right. Well, but do you understand what summation is? Summation is when you have like more when a number of uh, nervous sig signals join together to form one full action potential. So you have lots of small little signals. They're not going to have any effect. They won't form an action potential. If you get a big one, um, then it will. You know, full on action potential will have an effect. Now. Temporal is when you have lots of them, lots of small action potentials arriving at the same nerve junction in quick succession. And so those three kind of join up, they kind of increase the amount of, um, I believe it's acetylcholine, um, that is produced. Let me just check. Was any, yeah, yeah, it is. Neurotransmitter acetylcholine. And so, since you get three quick succession, lots of the lots of acetylcholine is released. So, on the other side, an action potential is produced. Spatial summation is when you get three, well, a number of action potentials arriving from different neurons at one um, uh, nervous junction, a synapse. And then again, this releases much more acetylcholine. So, on the other side, you get a bigger action potential being, well, you get an action potential being produced. Um, I hope that makes sense. Uh, Sam, um, before I answer your question, Sam, let me just make sure that uh, glitter girlie has understood summation. Then I'll do the chemistry question. Um, James B, yes, you can at the end, sure. Uh, yes, that is exactly what it's like, yeah. Um, yeah, that is it, exactly. Right, good. Um, so, you understand, Sam, you understand what uh, equilibrium is. It's the idea that um, a system, it can, you can get an amount of products and reactants being made at the same time, then you get a space or a you know kind of equilibrium state where there is a set amount of 
um, a set amount of products and a set amount of reactants. In A2, what we learn about is the kind of calculation side of it. So we learn about Kc, which is just if you have, um, where's an example of a liquid? Uh, Two SO2 plus O2 becomes two SO3. Right. Um, just say all of them are gas. I just because I forgot to write them in. So that's our equation. Um, once you've got this, the Kc basically is the products over the reactants. So we have concentration of SO3 over concentration of SO2, O2. And then the numbers, the coefficients in front of the um, chemicals become the power. So SO2 becomes squared, 2SO3 becomes squared, O2, 1, so we just leave it blank. That's the equilibrium constant. So do you get that so far? And then the units for KC just work it out. So here we've got mole per dm cubed, because it's concentration squared, over mole per dm cubed squared times mole per dm cubed. Now these two cancel, meaning that overall we have 1 over mole per dm cubed, which equals dm cubed mole minus 1. You can write that in any order, so I'm kind of writing it slanted. Um, And to get that, if you're given a concentration, um, if you're given a concentration or the concentration of these three, you just plug them in with the squared and you work out Kc. Equally, if you're given Kc and told to work out the concentration, let's say this, times Kc by these two, including the squared, square root it to get rid of the squared, and then you've got your concentration there. I'll just drop my pen. Um, Um, does that make sense so far? And if so, I will then continue on to the next bit. How temperature affected? Right. Um, well, it depends. There's four ways it can change it. Um, right. I'm going to stick with the same equilibrium. Right. Um, I'm going to be completely honest and say that I don't actually know if the forward reaction in this case is exothermic or endothermic, so I am going to make it up. Uh, I'm literally going to make up a complete random value. Uh, so, uh, uh, Jack makes it not necessarily. It depends on what the reaction is. So we're going to say that it is delta H equals plus 10 kilojoules per mole minus 1. So this reaction is endothermic. Now remember we said Kc equals SO3 squared over SO2 squared O2. Now we know that if let's say temperature increases on this reaction, it's going to shift to minimize its change. That's the Le Chatelier's principle. Now you're giving energy to it, so it's going to go to the side. It's going to go to the uh, 
endothermic side, which means it's going to go in the forward direction. It's going to go to this side, which means the bit on the top increases. Now, one sec. Now, once we got that, we know that the products on the on this hand side increased, um, and these decrease. Um, so, does that make sense so far? Where we are before we just go on. Uh, oh, come on. Um, well, while I'm waiting for the re reply about the KC question, um, I haven't finished it yet. Um, no, you only need to know the wavelengths absorbed by chlorophyll A and B. Actually, well, just chlorophyll in general. Um, anyone there? <laughs> um, Sam, have, have you understood what I've done so far? Cause I'm... Oh, uh, oh yes, great, right, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm doing OCR. Right, well, if you look here, as the top has increased and the bottom has decreased, if we just think of normal fractions, let's say we have um, 10 over 5. Now, 10 over 5 equals 2. Let's say we increase the top and the bottom. We can double the bottom and turn the other one into 2. Now, 20 divided by 2 equals 10. So the value overall is increased. So in this case, if the Ford reaction is endothermic and temperature increases, Kc increases, which means if the reaction, so in this case, if T decreased, Kc would also decrease. Because what you would be then getting is you're getting less of the product, more the reactant, so you get to do, to do, which means you get the opposite effect, so you can have a smaller Kc. So, to clarify, when endothermic, if T increases, Kc increases, if T decreases, Kc decreases. Okay, good. Um, and just to finish that off, in the exact same way, if you have, if the forward reaction is exothermic, so let's say we have X, and temperature increases, temperature decreases. Think about it. In this case, if the forward reaction was exothermic and temperature increased, it would go that way. So you have more of that, less of that. So overall Kc would decrease. And then it's the same Kc. So if it's endoth forward reaction is endothermic, Kc increases as temperature does. If it's exothermic forward reaction, Kc decreases when temperature increases and vice versa.
Uh, I hope that all makes sense. Um, right. Um, oh, again, quite a few bits on photosynthesis, which is good because there's someone who said you might not be able to attend this live stream and asked if I could go through the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. So I hope that's okay if any of you want to go through that. Um, Right. Um, again, um, Kate, I've just seen. Um, have you watched my video on um, DNA technologies I released today? Because that has all that material in it. If you want me to go over it again, I will. Just check. Um, all right. A primary, a primary pigment is basically uh, the ones in the reaction center, so the chlorophylls. Accessory pigments are ones in the photosystem all the way down, which is xanthophylls and the carotenes, those what and the carotenoids, ones like that. And they the car the accessory ones will just you know absorb proton uh, photons, sorry, photons and will pass them along to the main reaction center, which is where the uh, primary pigments are. Um, yep, sounds um glitter girly, yep, correct there. What is the primary reaction center? That is just the reaction. That's the, in a. Photosystem. Where you have chlorophyll here. That is where this is the primary reaction center. So yeah. Um, okay, fair enough. Um, oh, then since a few people want it, I will go through the uh, sequencing again. Um, Anyway, which what were you asking for all that? Uh, electrophoresis and genetic engineering. All right. Um, all right, Samuel, I'm going to do I'll do one now and one a bit later, so kind of split it up. Um, all right. So I'm just going to do, I'll do electrophoresis first. I mean, because I said I've been doing this topic all day. And it is a tad boring. Um, I will go through one. I will go through the other a bit later, I promise. Um, right. So I'll do electrophoresis first. Electrophoresis is actually um, really simple. All right, so you basically have... We call this our electrophoresis area. Negative, positive, and this is our cell. Not a biological cell, a fuel cell. Um, what you do is you have you got your DNA samples, which have been treated with restriction enzymes, which kind of spits them up. And you have many different restriction enzymes, so you have all different lengths. So you could have um, one base, two bases, three bases, four bases, and you get it all the way up to, you know, N bases. That's what NB, N, so any number of bases. And you want to separate these. Now, you have wells, which are cut here. In this medium, which is sugar, this is agarose sugar. The gel, once you've put your solution in this well, at the negative end, you place it in buffer solution. And um, once it's in, you, so you put it in buffer solution and then leave it for a while as an electric current is being passed through it. So it'll be going round in a circuit circuit. Now DNA, as you remember, has a base, a sugar, 
shouldn't really have drawn it as a circle. And then a phosphate group. Or phosphate groups. Um, phosphate groups are negative. That's the important thing. So that means they will go from negative to positive. Now, this gel, this agarose sugar gel, um, will kind of catch the longer DNA, the heavier DNA fragments. So, and the shorter ones will be able to get through a lot quicker. So when you get to this end, you'll have shortest, you have the longer one. I'm drawing it staggered, it wouldn't just so it fits. So the longer ones kind of stay further back and the shorter ones go further. And by doing this, you've kind of got them split up. What you can then do is lift them from the gel onto a nylon sheet. Well, you put a nylon sheet over the gel and cover it in paper towels and blot it, which is when you press it. So you kind of get them onto the paper towel. You then transfer the sheet and you can then analyze them for whatever you want to do. So now it's important to know that DNA fragments are not visible on the sheet. Um, and then what you'd want to do to show them is you'd either have a radioactive marker on the phosphate group or a fluorescent marker. But that's essentially electrophoresis. So um, out of all the people there who wanted this, I will do more on the DA. Does that make sense now on the electrophoresis? And for, uh, was it Samuel who asked that? Um, does that go into enough detail for you? Uh, and uh, George, I will answer your question next. Okay, um, Pear, I will go through the rate determining step. Um, so I'm doing this in order, the order it is asked. So um, yeah, I will get all of them done. Uh, it's a great show. Oh, th thank you, Matthew. Um, very nice of you to say so. Um, I'm assuming everyone's okay with the electro. Uh, how would you use electrophoresis uh, to get the DNA sequence? Electrophoresis doesn't get the DNA. All it does, it kind of separates the fragments you've got, which then can be taken and used and can be sequenced. Um, and someone's asked to do sequencing. I'm going to do that a little bit later, purely because I said, I've been doing. I've, if you've noticed, I've done two videos on it today. I've done it all day, and I've really. I don't want to do a huge amount of time on it. So, um, no, I didn't know we had 21 people watching. Woo. Uh, can you go through exam technique or you wanted to focus? I'm more than happy to go through anything, so I will go in through exam technique. I'm going to continue through the questions. So, um, vasodilation and constriction, how do you explain it? Um, right. Ah, that's actually an interesting question. Right, well, vasoconstriction dilation is always associated with the, ar the arterioles which are leading to the capillaries in the skin. So it's always near the skin. Vasodilation allows more blood into the capillaries near the skin surface, more heat can be radiated in the skin. Well, that's it. And in vasoconstriction, reduce the flow of blood through the capillaries near the surface of the skin so less heat is radiated. As far as I know, you do not need to know the mechanism of the dilation and constriction. But what it's going to be is that a change will be detected, you know, the homeostatic change. So if it's, let's say, uh, let's say it's too hot, it's going to be vasodilation. If it's too hot, the hypothalamus and, you know, heat receptors will detect it, and thermoreceptors rather, and it will send a nervous impulse to the arterioles, which will then const um, will dilate, so sorry, dilate and open up 
the lumen increases and more blood's allowed to go to the skin. That is essentially what it is. Um, Uh, is, it good, is it the idea behind it? Um, that's pretty much, I'm sure there are other uses for electrophoresis as well, but that is a main use of it, or the use we need to know about. Um, right, was it? Right. George, I hope that first bit answers it. And what do we need to know on the exam on homeobox genes? To be honest, I've not seen much, I, there's not much they can ask you on it. It's a stupid double spread, to be honest. It's not even done that well. Basically, you need to know that the body plan is controlled by homeobox genes. And actually, one thing I would suggest is if you get the o um, the CGP book textbook, it's quite got some good information on it there. Though it does make it a bit by confusing by calling it a different name. They call it um, homeotic genes, but really they are homeobox genes. And basically, what homeobox genes do. They code for part of a protein called a hemodomain, or sorry, a homeodomain, which binds to specific, specific sites on DNA, enabling the protein to work. They act as a transcription factor, which, in, like in the lac operon, will turn a gene on. Which means, so basically, these homeobox genes will go attach DNA, so RNA, um, so you can get the polymerase, sorry, binding and transcript, um, transcription translation happening. Um, once once they bind, it turns on the genes going, look, this is where this part of the body needs to be. You need to, you know, start growing legs here. And nowhere else in the body, where a part, you know, it's not going to say um, in a part of where the head should be, start growing legs because it's not meant to unless there's a problem. That's essentially, I think, what you need to know about it. And that might be even a little bit too much detail. But I hope that answers all your questions, um, George. Uh, um, Bradley, no, I cannot explain um, muscle contraction because I haven't learnt it yet. Equally, Mohammed, I cannot do the brain, but I can do the nervous system if it's from unit one or you know the um, F two one four. And sorry, anything from module four of the final unit, I cannot answer because I haven't done yet. Sorry. Um, all right. Can we go through the evidence of chemical osmosis? Do we need? To, um, right. Really, you don't actually need to know the evidence of chemical osmosis because they'll never. I've never seen them ask it. Um, it's kind of just one of those extra things, but just in case they could. Um, well, big. The evidence from it is. Um, if you think of what chemical osmosis is, it's got like the movement of protons, H plus ions, which cause a change in pH. If you look at the changes in pH, you can then um, see um, where it is. I mean, yes, again, it's, it's one of these that here, uh, how science works section. So they very rarely ask stuff on it. But um, you isolate mitochondria. If you, if you get rid of the outer membrane, you can look at what, you know, we. Oh, it's actually reasonably hard to explain. Uh... Well, if you have, if you get rid of the outer membrane, you can then access the intermembrane space, which will then just all the stuff will go out, and you can then rupture the inner membrane, releasing the matrix. So you can identify the various enzymes that are in the mitochondria, and so you can work out the link reaction the Krebs cycle take place in the matrix, while the electron transfer chain. Are embedded. Those enzymes are embedded in the intermitochondrial membrane. Now, mitoplasts don't have an intermembrane space or an outer membrane, so they produce very little ATP. So the intermembrane space must have been involved because the inner membrane can't be doing. Every, we know the outer membrane has nothing to do with it, but the intermembrane space does. The inner membrane doesn't produce much ATP, so there must be something on the intermembrane space. I think those are the main ones. It's looking at the pH in the mitochondria. In fact, when you remove the outer membrane, ATP has gone. Uh, 
Right, oh god. Right, um, okay. Bradley, yes, I will be making videos on all of Module 4 once I've learnt it, um, which should be in the next few weeks, so don't worry. Uh, Mohammed, if you want anything on the nervous system, can you explain exactly what? Because the nervous system is a reasonably big topic. Any other example? Um, the legacy papers are reasonably good. Or you can find, if you go type online um, F2, OCR F214 questions or F215 questions or question packs, you'll find some. Do bullet points are useful? Um, I always use full sentences. Yeah, the ecosystems and conservation is pretty boring. If you can give me exact questions or areas, don't just give a whole kind of module to teach because that will take quite a long time. So just specific sections. Can I go through rates of reactions? Um, you want from a table. Okay, uh, we'll do. Right, where am I now? Um, God. Right, done. I hope the evidence thing is okay. Um, rate determining step. Well, basically, it is a slow step in a multi step reaction, and um, you just need to be able to construct one or tell something from it. So, I'm going to have to give an example from the textbook here. Right. Right, so we've got the equation NO2 plus CO forms NO plus CO2. And we know the rate equation is um, K equals. Right, now the things you need to know from the rate equation is that anything that appears in the rate equation is part of the rate determining step, and to the power is the number of molecules in the first step. So we know the first step is NO2 plus NO2. And it'll be two steps. We know the next step, you're going to use carbon dioxide because it hasn't been used before. And you also know that you're going to produce a molecule of NO2 because otherwise you've got two molecules and there's only one molecule in the original equation. So now just let you know, it doesn't matter what you put here. As long as the equations balance and make sense in terms of the overall equation, the rate equation, you will get the marks. Now, NO we know is meant to be made, so I'm going to do plus NO3 becomes NO2 plus CO2. Uh, once let me read all the... Oh, my God. Uh... Oh, oh, God. Right. Um, Lauren, a mitoblast is something that has, is a mitochondria about its outer membrane. Right, okay, anyway, um, so as you can see here, NO2 squared is, so we know we have two molecules of NO2 in the overall equation, in the, in the rate determining step, sorry, so this is the rate determining step. In the actual equation, there's only one molecule, so we know one molecule is going to be given off in the next step. Now we know there's also a molecule of carbon monoxide in the overall equation, but it's not in the rate determining step because it's not in the rate equation, so we put it in the second step, and then you just fill it in. So we know what sh we know NO has to appear at one point, probably here, and you just kind of work it out. It's quite hard to explain, but I hope that makes sense through that example. Um, to be fair, James B, you are going to um, we're going to go through. You got tomorrow's as well. Oh my god, so many questions. Right, I'm. Oh god, right.
Um, Right, um, exam techniques I'm going to do at the end. I'm going to do that at 9 o'clock. I'll go through, I'm going to go through content until 9. After 9, I'll go through anything which is like, um, you know, exam technique wise to make that fair. So leave your questions about that till the end. Um, do you mind going through? Right. Rates of reaction. Yes, I can. Right. Uh, I'm just going to give you an example. You'll be given compound A, compound B, and let's say rate. I'm now going to just use any old values, okay? So, yeah, we have 1 and 2, we have 5, 5, and so on, and that'll become 10. Let's we'll say that is 2. Actually, that's no, not very good. I'm going to do four there, sorry. Okay. Um, don't worry about the units for now. I'm, I, I'm sure you're going to know this. Um, right. Now, actually, what, the way you answer it is you say, as concentration of A increased from 1 mol per dm cubed to 2 mol per dm cubed, the rate increased from 4, um, four mol per dm cubed s minus 1 to 8 mol per dm cubed s minus 1. As they both doubled, that means that A is first order with respect to the rate, um, with respect to the reaction. Then you say, and make sure you quote, so experiment 1 and 2. Experiment 2 and 3, as B is doubled from 5 to 10 mol per dm cubed, the rate times by 4 from 8 to 16. I'm sorry, from 4 to 16. Wait, sorry. Using experiment 1 and uh, 3, as 5 doubles, the rate times is by 4, which means it's been squared, which means it's second order. So overall, the reaction is K equals... Oh, whoops, no, sorry. No, 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 no. Rate equals K A B squared. And that's basically how you do it. I hope that makes sense. Um, right. How often I... Um, how often are you going to be doing live streams? I really don't know. Uh, have um, probably have often someone wants them. Oh god, there's a lot going on. Um, right, you've all kind of. Um, what is acclimatization in terms of the function of synapse? Acclimat um, it means that it's got back to kind of normal states. So when it releases the uh, enzyme which breaks down acetylcholine, it's got to get back to having no enzyme in there and also no acetylcholine. It's not got to get rid of both, so it's just as it was before. That's kind of acclimatization. Um, who's it? Pear, do you understand the table thing now, by the way? Um, OK, great. Glad you answered that. Hey, Steph, uh, another person from my school. Um, right. Uh, guys, since you're kind of all gone all over the place now about uh, light dependent reaction. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the light dependent reaction because someone else asked, it, asked for it right from the beginning. Um, I'm going to do it using my my diagram. Right. Now the first step, the important thing in the light dependent reaction is that you have light. Um, I start off with the um, photolysis of water, which is The half O2 goes into the air. So that's the photolysis of water. A 
allows acclimatization. Um, the next step we have so we have these. I always do it wrong. Around. Two e minus goes into photosystem two light electrons go up. We go down. So we've got e minus. We've got two e minus rather goes down the electron transport chain to photosystem one. We get two electrons again. Two e minus, which combined with The 2H plus to form 2H, which then causes NADP to become NADPH. It reduces it because it's adding to it. Um, now, As the electrons go down here, they cause you basically get energy being given off, which causes a right, so what happens is the electrons travel through a kind of um, a protein which causes so. These electrons pass through these carrier proteins, which causes H plus to move from the stroma, which is the inside of the chloroplast, to the thylakoid membrane space inside the thylakoid. And then the hydrogens go out again, it's really badly drawn, out of an ATP synthase. Yeah. And by doing this, ADP plus PI form ATP. Which then goes off to the next stage. Uh, God, that's a complicated diagram. Um, yeah, the bottom step line is photosystem one. Um, again, sorry, I can't say muscle contraction. I haven't learned that yet. Sorry. Um, so I'll go through it again. Photolysis of water, you get protons, electrons, oxygen, oxygen's um, kind of expelled into the air. The electrons go into photosystem two, the electrons are given out, go down the electron transport chain here to photosystem one, which then released, combined with the earlier protons, which then reduce NADP to NADPH. As the electrons go down this electron transport chain, they give energy to protons to come into the thylakoid space, which builds up a proton gradient. They then diffuse, so it's actively going in, diffuses out. As the hydrogen ions diffuse out, ADP plus PI form together to make ADP, sorry, ATP, which is then carries on to the next stage. Does that kind of clear up anyone's questions about the light dependent stage? Oh god. Um, um. Right. And then just to clarify, because I want to know the difference between this is non-cyclic. Cyclic photophosphorylation just goes from there to there, just as this stage here. So you get photosystem one, release two electrons, which then go down the transport chain, producing some ATP back into photosystem one. Um Um, I got four A's at AS. God, this is it's tiring doing all these. Right. Um, ligand substitution case stab. Right. Um, ligand substitution. Back to chemistry. Right. 
ligand substitution is just when it's kind of what it says when ligands are substituted. So if we have the traditional Cu H two O six two plus, right? So that's our ligand complex, and then we add. So that's another ligand. Overall, we get. Literally, what's happened is you have a ligand H2O and it's substituted by, from another ligand. It's that's pretty much what it is. All right. Um, K stab is literally. If you know how to work KC, you know how to do K stab. K stab is identical to KC except water isn't shown in the equation. So here, let's say this was an equilibrium. Your case your K stab would equal um, I'm gonna name the molecules slightly differently. A, B, C, and D, just so it fills up space. It would be concentration of C over concentration of A and B to the 4. So you can see water is ignored. That's all K stab is. It's KC but without the water. Um, um, good to go. Thank you for uh, explaining it. Um, Oh god, right. Um, right. Um, photos. A photo system is just an, a kind of like a funnel in the thylakoid membrane, which can absorb light and has chlorophyll in it, essentially. Uh, dominant and process. Uh. Right, Sherry, I right, guys, no more questions now, okay? Because I kind of won't be able to answer any more. So no more questions. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna answer the rest of them. Okay, thank you, Kate. Uh, all right, I'm um, Bradley. Cyclic phosphorylation occurs just because. Um, well, sometimes it does really. Um, It may be because there's a problem with photosystem two, or you know, you can't use photosystem two. Perhaps there is no water available because in photosystem, um, in the non in non cyclic, you need water. In cyclic, you don't. It also is something that can cause guard cells to open and close. That's something else it can do. So that might be the reason. Right. Right. Um, dominant and recessive epistasis. I will do because someone asked for this yesterday as well, so I'll definitely do that now. Um, right. Basically, well, firstly, what is epistasis? Epistasis is the interaction of different gene loci so that one gene masks or expresses another. So essentially, that means. Right. I'm going to start off with recessive. Okay. Now we're going to have a gene which codes for no. I'm going to say white. So you start off with an organism that has white. Recessive means so. Uh, the gene, right. You have a gene which can code for white, which will then code. For, sorry, it starts off white. Then a gene that will code for pink and a gene that will code for red. Pink one is a P for dominant, P for recessive. Red is R for dominant, R for recessive. Now, for the animal to go pink, what we have, let me just draw that. Right, the organism starts off white. Recessive epistasis means that if 
you have the recessive form of the neck of this gene, the white to pink gene, it will not be expressed. It will stay as it is. So let's say you had PP small, um, I'm going to do an underline for small p. It means if it's small p, small p, it will stay white. If it is either big P, small p, or big B, big P, so you basically have dominant, dominant traits expressed, it will then go to pink. Same thing happens. You have little r, little r, so the recessive form, it will be, it will not be expressed, it will be masked. If you have at least one dominant, it is expressed. That's what recessive epistasis means. So it just means you start off at one colour, let's say, or one uh, phenotype. If you have the recessive form of the gene, you stay as that phenotype. If you have at least one dominant, you go on to the next, you get the next phenotype. So you get gene one will be coded for. Then, if you had a recessive form of gene two, which goes from pink to red, you will not be shown, so you'll stay as pink. If it, if you do have the dominant, one dominant version, it'll be expressed. Now, do you understand that in terms of recessive epistasis? Um, so who asked, who asked about, oh yeah, um, Sherry, did that make sense? The ones you need to know about dominant and recessive epistasis. Just those two. There probably are more. There might be like co-dominant epistasis or something, where it's only expressed um, if they're equally presented. Um, Okay, I think um, well, until and until Sherry replies, I will just do dominant as well. In dominant, it's exactly the opposite. So same genes, but this time you need to. If you have a dominant gene, it will be masked. So before recessive epistasis, if it's recessive, the gene is masked. In dominant epistasis, if it's dominant, it is masked. And only if it's recessive will it show through. Same for next one. You you have to have the recessive form to go through, and if it's dominant, it will be masked. That's what it is. it's just the opposite of recessive. Recessive epistasis, if you have yes, it does a little, thanks. Basically, recessive, if you have the recessive form of the gene, it is masked. If you have a dominant form of the gene, it that gene is expressed and it can be in a sequence. In dominant epistasis, you have the dominant form of the gene, it's masked. If you have the recessive form, it will be expressed. Um, okay. Uh, I think the last question I've got is um, action potentials occur and how are they transmitted? Right. Uh, let me just check. Before I answer, I will answer that now because uh, you've been waiting. Um, oh, one sec. Sorry. Before I go. What, um, Um, why do I draw variants like that? I, I, I just do. It just means it just shows what can happen. You start off, you start off with no colour. If you have dominant, in, I'm talking about recessive right now. If you have dominant, it will continue to the next stage. If you have recessive, it will stay white. So I've just left it as that so you can see that it's recessive. Um, 
I've seen it. Oh, I can't remember. There is a. There is um an exam paper where they have it. If you look at all the exam papers, one of them has epistasis and it's drawn like this, except kind of diagonally, so kind of that way instead. But um, it's just kind of to show the passage of stuff. And don't worry, uh, let's go. Genetics are considered one. The three, I would say, the three hardest things in a biology is photosynthesis, respiration, and genetics chapter. Because genetics, those three chapters in particular, require a lot of understanding. And now, um, Mohammed's been waiting a long time, so I will now find the answer to the um, nervous system question. Right. As yet again, still quite a large question. Uh, how they generate, or how, firstly, how they generate it. Right. Um, Okay, thanks, Lauren. Yeah, so it's in the, if you look in the June 2010 paper, it's in there. Um, right, so Mohammed. Um, it's okay if I just, due to time stuff, if I just answer the first part of the question, how are they generated, and in another, another live stream, or if you want, email me, I will answer it fully there as well, just due to time. I will get the first part done. How's it generated? Right. Right. Well, basically, a stimulus will occur. An important thing. First thing is a stimulus will occur. Now, since since you didn't ask about this, I assume you understand the resting potential. So you've got three sodium. Um, you've got three sodium out for every two potassium in, and you've kind of got a resting potential. So the inside is more negative than the outside. Now, a stimulus will cause the sodium ion channels, which are normally kept closed, to suddenly open. This will flood in sodium ions. They diffuse in, which reduces the, uh, which depolarizes, depolarizes the membrane. Now, what happens is, because there's a sudden change, um, this causes um, voltage-gated sodium ion channels to further along to also suddenly open, because there's been a change in voltage. So they open as well, so more sodium ions flood in. So you get that change in voltage. And that's what it is, basically. It is a stimulus causes voltage-gated channels to open, or just normal sodium channels to open. Sodium ions diffuse in, inside the cell, or inside the neuron, and that causes depolarization. And if it reaches the threshold potential of minus 40 millivolts, so at rest it's about minus 60, if it reaches minus 40, it then will reach an action potential. Actually, I, I can probably um, very quickly explain the transmission. The transition is just basically sodium ions diffuse in. Once they're inside the cell, at let's say here, in, out, they diffuse into the cell. Which means you've got a large concentration here, you've got a small concentration here, and you've got zero concentration. I'm doing a uh, zero like that. Zero concentration here, so they'll diffuse sideways, which lowers the voltage or the um, um, potential difference. Sorry, I should say PD. Now this causes along the membrane more voltage-gated sodium ion channels to open, so more sodium ions diffuse in, then go across get more in. So that's what happens. You basically it's cause sodium ions diffuse sideways, which causes the voltage-gated channels to open, so they diffuse in, more diffuse in, depolarize the membrane further. They diffuse sideways, more diffuse in. Um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, please say if it doesn't, but if, if it doesn't, email me and I'll go through it again properly, but I hope that answers your question.
Um, Sherry, yeah, I probably, I'm doing an AS1 tomorrow, in case, if, if you know, for anyone who's doing AS1 is retaking, I'm doing one tomorrow. And after tomorrow, I'm going to leave it a few days at least, because I've done three in a row now, but probably, let's say on Thursday, so what am I doing on Thursday? Oh yeah, Thursday is my free day. So on Thursday, I will post a video saying, do you want more live streams? If so, when? ASA2, and I will do some more. And if you do really want them, I'll try and do at least one more A2 and one more AS by the end of the holiday. I'll do perhaps one in the Easter as well. Um, no, it can't. Because if you look, there's a high concentration here, low concentration here, so they all diffuse here. Now, overall, it's not going to diffuse backwards. And, yeah, it's, it, 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 no, it doesn't diffuse backwards is pretty much the simple answer. Because when the sodium ion channels close, they cannot be reopened for quite a while, so you don't get depolarization of combs. You've got that hyperpolarization. Yeah, the refractory. Um, so use his left. Side. No, no, I think that's just. Um, Mohammed hasn't actually replied. Uh, if you are still watching, uh, did that help? I just want to know if it helped. Uh, I hope it did. Um, anyway, um, I remember one thing. That since lots of you, since a lot of you asked, um, do you want? Still, um, I don't know how many of you wanted it have left. Uh, can you comment saying, you know, yes, I do, or please, can you go over that? If you still want to go over exam technique, because if you do, I will be more than happy to go over exam technique. One thing I do like about this actually that you guys join in as well and answering the questions. It's nice. It's good to kind of group revise rather than just listen to my boring old voice go on for about an hour and a half. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Oh, God. Um, yeah, boy. Yes. Yes, please. Smiley face. And yes, please. So I think that's a yes. Right. Exam technique. Right. Um, let's go over the boring stuff first, which is just kind of obvious. Read the question. It's always, you know, really obvious, but people do miss it out. Read the question. So I'm trying to find an example question now, actually. Um, sorry, one second. I'm just trying to find quite a good... Actually, I can't find a good example right now. I'm not looking through the whole book. But... Um... God, everyone wants to go. Um, Steph, I'm glad you want to go through exam technique for biology, considering you're not doing any level biology. Um, right, God, you'll want to. Right. Um, well, first thing, obviously, as I said, read the question. So if it is a described question, state what happens. If it's an explained question, explain what happens. So... Um, I think I'm, I'm literally just the way you need to do this is examples. Um, oh, um, is it, sorry, you can have to sit in silence for a minute while I try and think of a good example. Uh, 
Okay. Um, if I said um, describe describe the Describe the products that enter the light independent stage from the light dependent stage. There you'd say ATP and reduced NADP enter the light independent stage, and it'd be two marks. If you said explain, you would then have to also mention how that ATP was produced through chemiosmosis and that NADP was reduced because of the hydrogen atoms being added to it. It's that kind of thing. So make sure you know the difference between describe and explain. Oh, great, great, great example, growth curve. Yeah, um, so describe the growth curve. You have the log phase, I'm sorry, the lag phase, the log phase, the stationary phase, and then the death phase. To explain it, you'd have to go into more detail about what's happening at each stage. That's, that's a great example, actually, yeah. So, so also to describe it, I'd say you have the um, lag phase, where not much reproduction happens, so it stays fairly stable. And then the log phase, where the reproduction grows exponentially. The stationary phase, where reproduction equals death. And then the death phase, where reproduction is not as high as the death rate. Then explaining, you have to explain it in terms of the amount of um, nutrients, the space, the competition, the fact waste and toxic products are being produced. So yeah, that's a great example. Thanks. Um, right. Uh, big things, if you ever have any question which involves a graph or a table, quote figures from it. So if I showed you, I'm just going to show you. Uh, this is just any old curve. And let's say we have, I'm just going to give up. One, two, three, four, two, three, four. Let's say this is time in min, and this is length in meters, in, yeah, meters, too late if I've written meters. Um, it doesn't matter too much. Basically, what you have to do is you have to look at the number of points of interest, and there are this number of, there is this point of interest, that point of interest, that point of interest, and that point of interest, and for each one, quote a figure. So between one and three minutes, the length increased uh, proportionally from zero to, I'm going to say four, it's a little bit less, four. Then at about three and a half minutes, between three and four minutes, it leveled, it, the rate decreased and then leveled off. After four minutes and before five minutes, the length decreased from four meters to one meter. And between five and seven minutes, it leveled off. The length leveled off and stayed at about one meter. So make sure you always quote values. And then the other big thing is really big thing. Use keywords. Always use keywords. So just think when you're writing your answer, am I using every keyword I can? If you need to jot them in the margin so you know what uh, words you need to be using. But it's really important to use the keywords and you know use them correctly. So if you're talking about, um, let's say we're talking about action potentials, how they're generated, make sure you mention voltage gated sodium ion channels. Don't mention anything else. It has to be voltage gated sodium ion channels. So make sure you mention it perfectly. Um, so yeah, just make sure you, that's why it's really important to just keep going everything so you see what the exact words are meant to be. Another thing is two marks in each paper will be quality of written communication, and it's good to know what they are there for. In unit four or unit one for AS, they will be given for spelling. You will have to spell three words correctly. So um, yes, quote units two, yeah, obviously. Because um, you can't just say, you know, between four and five, four and five what, four and five minutes. Um, what was I saying? Um, Oh yeah, in unit four and unit one, you will have to um, spell three words correctly. In unit one, they're easy words like cells, but in unit four, it could be something like, um, let's say it's on the kidneys, they might want renal, glomerular, Bauman's capsule, uh, efferent, afferent, any of those, you have to spell them correctly, and you have to do three of them, and that'll be twice in the paper. 
in unit five and unit two, they will ask you to do something else. So it might be, let's say it was DNA replication, it might say, make sure you show the sequence of the steps that happen. If it is a graph question, it might say, make sure you link your um, answer with the results in the table, or make sure you back up your answers. So they will tell you what they want, just make sure you get it, you do that. So unit one and unit four is spelling, unit two and unit five is generally linking or you know sequencing something. All right, those are the big things. So we've got reading the question carefully, then quoting units and values from tables and graphs, quality written communication, keywords. Um, generally, I've had a few people ask about timing in exams, and I would suggest for all exams, do it in this order. You want to answer questions in this order. We start off doing the short and medium questions, so that's you know, one to four or five markers first. Then, um, by easy, I mean anything you can do. Anything you can't easily do, I would count as hard. I'm not counting a medium, I'm counting easy and hard, just as in ones you can do and ones you can't. Then, do the, you will have two long questions. Do the two long questions. Unless you really, really can't do it, do them. I have example in unit uh, two. Um, in unit two and unit five, you can get a ten mark question. Have two of them, and that's twenty percent of the paper. So get them answered if you can. And by now, hopefully, you should be you know good two thirds of the paper done. Then go back and answer the hard and short questions and then go for then go for the um, bigger difficult questions so so what you want to do is you want to do short and medium and easy then the long questions so you want to so all the really easy marks, which are like one to five marks, then the two long ones, then do the shorter, harder questions, and then only then go through and do all the hard questions you uh, couldn't do. If you try to do it in that order, it means that if let's say you do run out of time, so you have two hours and you have you know you don't have time for ten marks. Hopefully those ten marks will be in that category, and those are the ones you couldn't do or are struggling to do. The worst thing that can happen is you are spending your time doing these questions in you know question six out of seven, and question seven is has ten short marks which is easy, and you've missed that one out because you were focusing on this one. So leave the hardest ones till last, do the easiest ones first. Yeah, right. Um, I noticed the, the experiment questions. In unit four in particular, you're guaranteed an experiment question, and it is horrible. And that one, I suggest, firstly, leave that one till the end. That's one of the hardest ones. Leave it to the end. But what you need to do is you need to look at the information. They'll give you a block of text. Read it, underline keywords. Then look at the information you've been given. What can you see about that information? Even though they've said that if they add chemical one, respiration increases. If they add chemical two, it doesn't as much. If they add ke chemical three, it stops respiration. You then have an idea of what each chemical is doing. Then really read the question, underline what they want you to look at. So you know which experiments, you know which one out of perhaps the three different examples they used. And it's basically just, it's going to sound like really. Um, it's a kind of a really bad answer. You just kind of have to do it and hope for the best. It is, I, I struggle with those questions, I will admit. If you just kind of really carefully pick apart the question and see what they're asking, see what they're telling you, because if it's something you haven't learned before that's not you know, in the textbook or something, they cannot question you on it without explaining it well enough for you to understand. So all the information will be given to you. So really carefully read it. 
and then just slowly write it. Make sure you're linking any values you quote, you link all these ideas. There will be there will be something in that question you know about, otherwise they wouldn't be asking it. So just see what they're linking it to. Is you know in respiration is it anaerobic or is it an enzyme? Um, yeah, that's really the best I can do for that. Um, those sort of questions. Just kind of pick it apart and really understand what you're on answering and take your time. Um, I did a question and got it completely wrong, uh, an experiment question because I've never seen it. I went through it in my teaching, she very slowly went through each section of the question. I mean yes we took far too long on it but she showed me how to answer it, underlined everything, kind of made little notes in the margin about what each statement was telling me and then I saw what the question was asking and that was from the June 2013 paper. Um, mm. I think it was, I can't remember what it was about actually, but um, yeah, that's the best thing to do. I hope that kind of answered your question. Yeah, and also um, I'll give you one, one little tip. If you ever see any question which ever says explain how mm is specialised to do something, whatever it may be, answer bigger, air, um, larger surface area to volume ratio, it's always correct. Yeah, exactly. The questions are something along in the paragraph. Uh, makeup is all about you. Um, I do OCR, so I'm a little bit more inclined for OCR, but stuff like quoting values, um, having keywords, the order in which you should answer your questions, is very much applicable to all exam boards. And really, all these tips are the way you answer one exam question is going to be that different. So all it is is that basically is OCR is harder than any others. All well, three of you answered OCR. Um, yeah, now, as I say, it is specified to OCR, but it does apply to any exam board. Just as I said, OCR is harder in the content than the others and goes into more detail, which is a bit annoying. But, um, yeah, that's most of my tips I can give anyway. Uh, is there anything else that you guys can think about? Because I've got 10 minutes or so, so I need to go in 10 minutes. Also, I have done a video on how to answer exam questions. It's somewhere in the depth of my videos. If you look back, you'll find it eventually. But, um, yeah, if you have a look, you should find it. Yeah, I've heard Salter's B is kind of awful. Um, poor you. But then again, my chemistry teacher, for some reason, tries to keep teaching us um, OCR B material. I don't know why. Keeps throwing it in. We don't need to know it. Um, Sam, I will be doing papers over the next half term. I'm currently focusing on getting the content videos done. Once all of them have been done, I will be then um, doing past papers. I aim, I aim to get at least one of each of the A2 units done, and if I can, I'll get two done. I can't promise I'll get two done, but I'll make sure I get one done of each type. Um, now this re revision session wasn't just exam techniques. We did an hour of um, content. But um, from 9 o'clock, we've been doing exam technique. And yes, I am a student. I'm in A2.
No, we don't get biology essays in our exam. I know that AQA have a big biology essay which you know has everything in it. We don't get that. Um, we get two big questions, you know, ten markers, so ten two ten percent questions. We don't get any uh, essays, luckily. People, okay, I'm, I'm going to have to clarify this on this video. People keep asking me for my notes, and I honestly cannot give them. I, I would if I could, but A, I don't know where my um, all my AS notes are unless you mean A2 Unit 1, and even then, all my notes are handwritten, and I do, like, hundreds of pages of notes, so I have no way of sending them, so I'm really sorry I cannot send people my notes. I'm sorry. Ah, you're you're welcome. It's actually um, just good to add uh, F two one five. Add synoptic stuff into all exam questions. I saw in Unit Four a good like ten percent of the paper or more was just AS stuff. So always add AS stuff where possible. But yes, definitely in the harder questions. Um, so yeah, if you can add synoptic, it'll be obvious where you need to add it in. And generally, it's just kind of it's obvious where you'll need to add it in if it's you know, about an enzyme or something, particularly about enzymes, they love throwing that in. Oh, um, yeah, sorry, Jack, I saw your question earlier, forgot to answer it. Um, right, I suggest go through the books and yourself draw a diagram which suits you best. I, I At home, I have some diagrams which suit me best for photosynthesis and respiration. And then, um, oh, it was actually George who asked that question. Oh, sorry. Um, whoever asked it. Um, yeah. Just write down a section which works best for you. And make sh then kind of talk yourself through it. Make sure you understand what's happening at each step. So once you understand it, it will come, be a lot easier to remember. Once you understand it, just copy it down a million times. And then you will, uh, you will start to remember it. Copy it down each time, trying to do as much as you can, you know, on your own without having to look back. And you should start to get it. Just keep practicing and make sure you understand. And each time you can talk yourself through. Um, Bridge a video of F3. Um, I've done two on F324. I've been focusing on biology because it's more of a biology channel than the chemistry. I do do chemistry, but I focus on biology. So I'm, I can tell you, um, over the next three days, I am finishing Unit 5 Chemistry, I'm then having Thursday off, and between Friday and next Tuesday I will have all of F324 done. So by next Tuesday, all videos on A-Level Chemistry will be done. Um, I have um, Brown, like Brownie, I've gone through the evidence for chemiosmosis, it was some time earlier. You might have not been here for that bit, but I have gone through it. It was basically due with looking at uh, pH, and then if you remove the outer membrane, realizing that ATP isn't produced as much, so you need the intermembrane spaces, things like that. And how do I stay motivated? Because I have to, essentially. Um, I want to get into, I've got an offer to study biology at Imperial for three A's, and I need those three A's. So if I revise, I get the three A's. If I work hard, I will get those three A's and get into you know, my dream university to do my dream career and then my dream job. Um, yeah, once you've done it and you've done it so you can remember it, perhaps stick it on your wall and every day just have a look at it and just, you know, talk yourself through it. So, um, yeah, just talk yourself through it and just keep looking. Just look at it like once a day for 30 seconds. You literally just look at it and go, yep, 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 that step and that step and that step and it should stick. Oh. Do you like my shirt? Um... Thank you, but uh, yeah.
Um, <laughs> it's going to sound. Uh... Oh, we got someone else is going to. Oh, that's awesome, Anna. You're going. To... Um, is that for next year, 2014, to study biological sciences? Because if so, that means we'll be in the same year, so that'd be pretty cool. Um, if so, you have to see if you can recognise me by voice. That'd be pretty cool. Um, what's my dream job? Right. My dream job, really sadly, is honestly to be an A-level biology teacher or maybe lecturing. I haven't fully decided, but I would definitely teaching either A-level standard or lecturing. Um, what I want to do after my biology degree, I want to get a PhD in biology first, in evolutionary biology, and then after that, either go into lecturing or teaching in A-level biology. Okay, so well, we might see each other there then. I'm sure biochem overlaps a little bit. That's pretty cool. Uh, thanks, saying I'll be a good teacher. I hope so. Uh, how long do I revise a day between three and four hours? That includes making videos, so I count that as part of my revision. Right. I say, um, I say, um, do one subject per day, so you're kind of focused on that subject, and do. Basically, set yourself a goal for each day. Don't set yourself you know, a certain amount of time. Set yourself a goal. So let's say you'll do biology, and I'd say set yourself the goal to fully revise excretion and work until you have got it revised. And don't, you know, have small breaks whenever you're feeling a little bit tired. Um, and then just, yeah, keep going over that one thing until you've got that section done. Um, so set yourself manageable goals. Don't like you say, you know, oh, I will revise all of Unit 4 today because you just won't get it done. But do that. And then go back to it regularly. So if you can, for five minutes a day, just look at what you did yesterday so it sticks in. And then at the end of the week, have a look at everything you've done that week just so it kind of sticks in. If you keep reminding yourself of it, Um, I would, I'll think about it. I'm going to do an AS1 tomorrow and then I'm having two days off from live streaming because I need a break. Um, and then on Thursday, I, I, probably I will release a video on Tuesday saying, you know, guys, what do you think? Do you want more? When will be good? And then we'll decide if we're going to do any more. Oh, sorry. Um, I misunderstood your... Yeah, okay. Um, do I count these live streams as revision? No, I don't count these live streams as revision, actually. Um, ten minutes. You won't need that long. Maximum half an hour, really. I mean, literally just needs to read through all the things you've done. Perhaps at the end of... If you're you know, reviewing what you did yesterday, five minutes, um, ten minutes maximum. If you're reviewing what you did for the whole week, somewhere between half an hour and an hour, but it shouldn't take that long. Yeah, you'll never be able to finish a whole unit 
you, you'll be lucky to finish a module in biology because it takes so long. And uh, um, live streams do not count as my revision. I do, uh, considering it's only my second one, I do not count it. Um, yeah, it does actually help, but um, this is more I would count as revision as such because I'm kind of just talking really um, and answering questions. Um, yeah, I guess it is. Well, if you count that, it means I'm doing four to five hours each day. Anyway, um, anyway, I I now need to go, and I hope this uh, helped you. As I say, I'm doing an AS one tomorrow at five thirty. Unless anyone comments saying they want it changed later, but as far as I can see, five thirty looks good. Um, okay, um, really tips and maths practice. Just practice. Get as many different textbooks as you can, which all have you know questions in it, and just practice them. Yet again, the CGP textbook is very good. Just practice, though. Practice, practice, practice. That's all I can suggest. Um, anyway, I I hope this helps you. Again, I will arrange new ones, new revision sessions. I'll put up a video on Tuesday saying you know when do you want more videos and stuff like that. But um, I hoped. I hope this all really helped. Um, um, Glitter Girlie, I'm, I'm assuming you mean that in terms of re your revision. Um, if you know the whole con if you know the whole content, yeah, feel free to do just a general F21 session. Um, that's when you want to start doing papers, though. It's so important to do papers. Anyway, um, cool. Yeah, no more questions. So I do need to go. So um, yeah, I'm going. To, I'm going to leave once I say goodbye. I will continue reading the comments until you've all stopped as well. But I will stop speaking now. So thank you very much for watching. Um, I hope this all helped and. Uh, I will see any of you who are doing AS who are randomly here as well. I'll see you um, tomorrow at 5.30 and that's changed. And the rest of you I will see you if we do another live stream probably on Thursday. So thank you and goodbye. <laughs>